<laughs> red wave? More like a red tinkle. The breakdown starts now. <laughs> Welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is the Rick Wilson. And we are not, we are in a better mood than we thought we were going to be at the I've been in a better mood since I've been in about a goddamn year, Tara. <laughs> Which is, it's crazy because Tuesday we were preparing ourselves for what everyone thought, including us, that there was probably going to be a red wave. And you know what? We were wrong and I've never been happier to be wrong, Rick Wilson. I like when I'm wrong about things like this. Listen, because it's I'm good delighted, for America. I'm delighted to have been wrong. Uh, and 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 I wasn't as wrong as a lot of people because yeah. mine my I called publicly that they were they were only gonna get to 218 or so. Mm -hmm. I always thought the house would fall shorter. Yeah. Um, but I I I am delighted right now that we are in still in the fight in Arizona and Nevada. Uh, I'm delighted with the outcome of our work where, and, and folks, I want to make an emphasis of this because we're going to tell you this over and over again. Mm -hmm. Our target states this year were not just the big glamour races. It wasn't, oh, we're going to go help Stacy or Beto. No. Right. We focused on a, a handful of key races that were vital for American democracy. And if those races went down for whatever reason, the 2024 election would not matter. That's right. It so, was the long game. We were part, it, this part of our strategy this year was the long game. It was beyond 2022 right. because we've been saying this for a long time that 2022 would be determinant of 2024 in a lot of respects, including all of these election deniers running on the ballot and what would right. happen to our election system and our democracy if they won. And we are happy to say, which is why Rick and I are so jubilant, even though it looks like uh, Republicans are going to retake the House, but the, but by we'll a much see. smaller. I still don't. I'm, I mean, maybe, done. maybe. I mean, yes. There's still there's still a chance. There's still a chance, likely that they are going to take the House. But if they do, it's still going to be in a very small margin, and that's going to wreak absolute havoc on Kevin McCarthy's dream job of becoming Speaker, which I've said he won't. And a lot of the um, media media stories out today are all about this jockeying for position and what what Kevin McCarthy is going to have to do. He tried to claim that he's got the votes to be speaker. No, he doesn't. So don't be fooled by that. If he, he had the votes to be speaker, he wouldn't be you know what? He wouldn't have spent 45 minutes in a one on one behind closed door meeting with Marjorie Slothto. That's right. I promise you. He was in That's there like, right. please, Marjorie, I need right. you. You can be the chairman of Ways and Means. And he, I mean, he was that 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 shit was obvious from a mile off. Absolutely. And um, the Freedom Caucus holds all the cards here. Those are all the MAGA crazies. And I saw the list of demands that they want from McCarthy if they want okay. to vote. And it's crazy talk. Now, it's crazy talk in Washington speak. I'm not going to bore people with it tonight. A lot of it is procedural changes they want in the House. They want to dilute leadership uh, power in the House. Like they, Very like... I'm not going to get into all of it unless you're like a Capitol Hill person, but you can you can see what it is. The Hill did a story on it, but these are things that that would give that would decentralize power from committee chairman and leadership. Well, of course, because they want they want to empower the crazies to be able to do all kinds of things and with legislation and committee hearings and all of this stuff, and nobody right. wants that. So, um, not sure that that Kevin McCarthy is going to acquiesce to those demands because it would fundamentally change how that how that House works. Nobody wants that. So, no. but Kevin McCarthy is in quite the pickle because he has to deal with this MAGA caucus. And I don't think that he's going to survive it. I really don't. And I've said this for quite some time. And because the margin is will be so small if they get it, it only, it'll be less than 10. Um, that's going to be a hell of a leadership race to watch. But the other reason why we're so happy, as Rick was starting to say, is that the races in the states that we targeted, four out of five, we're four out of five right now with Arizona still underway and, and looking good and that's looking right. good that's right definitely looking good for the senate race there secretary of state race and you know the the governor's race is razor thin but everybody else i mean with, Ke yeah. with mike kelly i mean with uh kelly up ninety nine thousand votes now yeah we're Masters. done we're, we're done with the senate counting i think uh yeah. in terms of any worry and folks the arizona race that we cared about the most dirty little secret 
I like Mark Kelly. Great dude. Wanted to be elected. Wanted to be in the Senate. I like Katie Hobbs. I didn't love her campaign, but I like Katie Hobbs just fine. I really, really wanted to get Mark Fincham and put him in the dirt, and we yes, did. And we right. were one of the few the groups state. that went after Fincham, and he was one of the most dangerous QAnon election denier crazy persons mm-hmm. for any seat out there this year. And that takes some doing in MAGA world. For sure. And the same thing in Nevada, actually, too. We're watching what's going on there very closely. Uh, you have another Oath Keeper QAnon election denier crazy in the Secretary of State race out there as well, and Jim yep. Marchant. Um, so, but there's still that that's going to be razor thin too. And there is there is reason for optimism in Nevada. Um, and if the Senate races go as we've been watching, if they if they both go Democrat, then Georgia doesn't really matter as much. And that'll be it'll matter in that <laughs> we don't want Herschel Walker in the Senate. But as far as um, controlling right. the Senate, it won't matter anymore. But um, but we will still make sure that we we have a presence in that as well because it's um, important to democracy. But yes, yeah, so Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, um, these were states that were incredibly important to us and victorious. And, you know, Rick, talk a little bit. We always talk about the Bannon line, right? Right. What role did the Bannon line play in some in a place like Wisconsin? Look, the Bannon line, folks, as we've heard us talk about a million times, is there's a range of voters that are soft Republican voters, that are independent-leaning conservative voters. They tend to be more female, more educated, a little more affluent, and they tend to have a little higher educational attainment. This year... Or in, pardon me, in 2020, there were about 3 to 8%. This year, because of Dobbs, it expanded that window a little more, maybe up to about 11% at the top end, maybe up to about 5% at the bottom end. We were able to go out and talk to those Bannon Line voters this year on a number of issues in the states, especially Wisconsin, that absolutely blew the doors off and no one knew we were doing it. We were doing it all digitally, under the radar. Trigvi Olson, Jeff Timmer came up with a absolutely sneaky ass devastating strategy where we rolled up messages in 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 wisconsin stretching in a certain band of counties we needed to win Mm -hmm. we moved tony evers from basically plus two with the bannon line to about plus six with the bannon line we also dialed it and and the message we used wasn't the same political message everybody else was using it wasn't all that it was about ukraine Mm -hmm. about the the republicans (laughs) were going to flip and change sides in Ukraine. And that message just drove the numbers. They're like, nope, I remember b- communism is bad, Russia's bad, I'm gonna stick with my... And it absolutely blew the doors off of these people. And then in the closing days of the campaign, we very carefully geo-targeted college campuses with our great ad by Le- with Leslie Jones, Yes, drove it through the eyeballs of if you, if you lived in Dane County, where, where the University of Wisconsin is in, in, in Madison, mm-hmm. you, and you used a phone or a computer, you probably heard or saw that ad six times in yes. the days leading to elections every day. It and was that's pounding, how you do it. pounding, pounding, pounding. Record youth turnout. And turning out, Tara, as you know, turning yes. out young voters is the hardest job in politics by far. We were able to sneak in there and and save the governor's seat in that in that state uh we we believe we had a significant i mean we measured it we were watching it we were watching the change in these voters and tony evers was in trouble yep we went in there with 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 a strategy we didn't talk about we didn't brag about it we didn't make it public and i will tell you folks a dirty little secret i've said this before i said it on the show the other night Get always watch what we're doing we're doing with this hand we're out like viral (laughs) ads or punching ron DeSantis or donald trump with the other hand, we're slipping the knife in on some bad guy because we built a bunch of systems this year in these key states to go after very targeted audiences. We're the best voter targeting operation in the country right now. We went after very, very selected audiences, and we didn't just want to move like 20% of them. We wanted to move all of them, and we pushed that button in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Arizona. A little bit in Nevada, not as much. We mostly put grassroots in Nevada. Yeah. We didn't go into Ohio for a lot of reasons. We weren't really right. inv- involved in Ohio for a lot of reasons, um, <laughs> and, which I'll make clear later. Yeah. Um, but we, we are absolutely delighted with the outcome so far. 
We're absolutely thrilled. It's true. And, and, and we should be because democracy was on the ballot, as we said over and over again here, as we've said on other media shows, we've, we've mm -hmm. been drilling that home. President Biden was drilling that point home. Yep. And some people were critical of him saying that, oh, that wasn't the right closing message. Guess what? It was the right damn closing message. And sure it needed to come was. from, and it needed to come from the president of the United States. He's it a sure statesman, as hell was. and he is the he is the marquee example of what democracy looks like as the leader of the free freaking world. So you know what? To all of those people who kept saying that, well, he, he didn't talk enough about the economy. He didn't talk enough about this or that. There were plenty of others that did that, and there were other ways that maybe they could have talked a little bit more about their accomplishments with what they were doing with the economy. But ultimately, people when they went into that booth and pulled that lever or mailed that ballot off, they looked at the crazy and said, you know what? We're not going back there. We're not, right. we're not doing that because you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll deal with what's happening now. It will change. It will get better. We're going in the right direction at least. And we don't have a crazy in the oval office and we don't have crazies mostly at, in Congress, you know, on the democratic side who are yep. threats to democracy. So this is something that's very different. Most of the time you have independent voters or undecideds, they break for the, the, the other side because right. they're usually unhappy with the party in power. That didn't happen this time. That goes against conventional political wisdom, Rick. That doesn't happen. Like it that. really it's does, different. Tara. And, and, and look, we had, we had an eye on this election from the beginning where, where we said, we predicted they're going to make it about crime. Yep. They're going to make it about critical race theory, culture war, BS. They're going to make it about inflation and gas prices. We knew it from the beginning. We knew it from January on. This was never a secret. But we also kept saying and kept insisting it's about the future of this republic as a constitutional democracy. Mm -hmm. It is about the future of this country, about whether your vote counts, about whether your vote matters, about whether you get to cast a ballot that is accepted and that the result of the election is determined by who gets 50% plus one vote. That's right. Instead of by insanity, <clears throat> conspiracy, uh, coup plotting, all this other craziness. Violence. I think America. Political violence. A, yeah, political violence. America had a great night on Tuesday. Yep. Had a great night for a bunch of reasons. One is people turned out. And by the way, yes, Gen Z came out to vote. You know who else came out to vote? Gen X fucking went to school. Gen X went to school. <laughs> I mean, they came out in a in a number that Finally. blew people the hell away. Finally, our gen my generation Finally. gets the credit. At long last. <laughs> we're but, good for something. But but this this moment, there were a lot of people in this country who looked at the crazy and yeah. said, Hell you know no. Why? That's hell no. Me. That's what they said. That's like hell no. Jones. They said That's hell no. Um, but you know something else, and and I'm gonna. I'm going to address your little moniker tonight because yes, Rick, please you have, do. You you always have uh, little little nifty monikers that you put up sometimes because and it's always a message to something that's happened, um, in a second. But uh, so as we wrap up the the our kind of where we are in our post election analysis here, and obviously votes are still being counted, and that's what we want. The system is working. Uh, so far, so good. No political violence, which is a good thing. And um, that's why we're happy. Democracy is is alive and well for now. The work continues, though. Let's not get complacent. But we'll talk about that next next week and, and, and beyond. Right now, we're just going to be happy with the fact democracy is alive and well. And, whew, and you're, Andrew said uh, in our chat the other night, he said, democracy is a tough bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, and I did. and I I've kind of kept that in my mind. I'm like, we should do a <laughs> bumper sticker, a, a hat, uh, you know, a mug, something like I that. I think we need some merch on that. Ryan I Wiggins, think we need some attention merch on, on the merch. Democracy is a tough bitch. Um, well, you know who's not? You know who's just a bitch and not a tough one? <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 um, He's truthing as we woo, do this right now. He folks. sure is. And he ain't um, happy. He's not happy. He's been bitching and whining for days now because guess what? The Republicans the are starting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yes. Shout out to Sam and I'm doing our banners. Oh my God. Where was that nickname for DeSantis? We, right? we put out the, we put out the, the call for action. Give us uh, your nicknames for DeSantis. The saggy pants is pretty funny. Um, Anyway, where, where was I now? Oh, yes. So Trump. 
So Trump has been quite upset because the red wave didn't happen and the and the conservatives and the conservative intelligentsia and media ecosystem, everyone is having a big cry fest about, oh my God, we, this was terrible, this was awful, and it's all Trump's fault. They are blaming Trump. Now, this could be a shift because we did see this after he denied the election. We saw it after January 6th. But I don't know, Rick. I don't know. We'll see how long this lasts because you had everybody from Kelly McEnany all the way to Laura Ingram to the front page of the of the uh, New York Post. Trumpy Dumpty, they called him. They are all the National Review. You had all these people who are coming out who are Trump sycophants now saying, mm, you know, maybe he should delay that announcement. You know, that Trump, you know, Trump just couldn't stay out of the race. Pat Toomey's blaming Trump for Oz losing. I mean, the circular firing squad is Oz murdering dogs is why Oz lost. Yeah, exactly. And, and Oz is, <laughs> and and is shit tier, low life <laughs> scumbag. A whole campaign making fun of Fetterman's stroke is why Oz lost. Yes, uh, for a number of reasons. And, and of also course, we had a trick. We, we we played our trick there too, folks. What do we do in Pennsylvania? We didn't go after Oz very much. You know why? Because everybody else was spending a hundred billion million dollars there. We went after Fetterman, uh, or we went after Mastriano, Mastriano. Because by by making Mastriano radioactive, it made the whole Republican ticket radioactive. That's right. Down ballot. That's why. That's why and, we always and our, say. And our ad attention. there about. I mean, because also Mastriano is a vicious, vile, disgusting uh, anti-Semite. Anti yes. And our our our, our spots there uh, on the on the on the Tree of Life massacre. It was a very powerful spot. It was one of those ones that was hard to make and hard to watch. Yes, but true. And, and we had some very good, truth. wise counsel inside and outside the, the organization on it. Mm -hmm. But we knew that once Mastriano was associated with with the truth about who he is, an anti-Semite. Yep. Um, that that ball game could be used to drag down Oz as well, which it did, and also the fact that the you know what else dragged down Oz, the magnetic force from New Jersey, where he lives. <laughs> New Jersey just kept pulling him back. So and, uh... <laughs> so somebody the other night made a joke about Oz is flying his he was on his plane. I think Reed said it. Oz is already on his plane back to New Jersey. Turns out he actually was. <laughs> Of course. Turns he out was. he fucking left that night and headed back to New Jersey <laughs> to one of his ten mansions. Oh, he said, "Fuck this place, I'm out." You know, right. like this just. Oh my god. Yeah, these people, they're just so horrible. So this this pile on now with on uh, Donald Trump has it's been just delicious to watch. Of course, we're sitting here going, <laughs> "Yeah, let's see." How <laughs> this is that. going to Wegner's, one is, of our. Yeah, he's going to Wegner's. Yeah. Oh my god. Um. But here's the thing. So Mike Pence, right? Mike Pence, poor Mike, little Mike Pence. He thinks that he has a chance to be president. He doesn't. But he wrote a little book instead of testifying in front of the January 6th committee. Um, so he wrote a little book that's going to come out next week, I think. And in the book, he's talking about um, Lincoln Project. There is a blurb in there where he blames basically one of the Lincoln Project ads we put out about Pence right after the election in 2020 that, of course, Donald Trump saw because we live rent free in Donald Trump's head. And All the he time, every day. Out, he flipped out on Pence and basically said that you're going to be considered a big wimp and wuss and no one's going to like you unless and you that ad makes said. you look bad, Mike. Right. That ad makes you look bad. <laughs> Unbelievable. So now January 6th is our fault. Okay, we we may. Trump, sorry, I bro. Say, sorry, is, sorry, Trump everybody. Is, you Trump know, is like an abusive husband. You know, you made me hit you. Right. That's right. He's he's the, like. he, Donald Trump's the Ike to his Tina. Yes, unfortunately. Don't make me angry, Tina. It's just less talented. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, no shit. Um, so yes, so this, so you have this DeSantis now as emerging as the heir apparent. It's not poor little Mike Pence. No matter how much he tries to make himself seem to be the, you know, the, the righteous choice here. DeSantis is being um, king, you know, crowned the heir apparent. We, of course, have been playing around in this space for quite some time. And um, everything I you're seeing tonight, <laughs> folks, is literally because during the Mar-a-Lago party two nights ago, the Mar-a-Lago <laughs> election party, we were running ads divide ginning up the trump desantis fight <laughs> at mar-a-lago on their big screens while they're watching fox 
Yes, indeed. Um, and if you want to see what Trump saw, was that in between him screaming at Melania and blaming her for Oz losing? Or was it when he was running around screaming about uh, Ron the Sanctimonious when he had time, right? He's been truth truthing uh, today. Oh, all he's about been the truthing Santas. like a mofo he's, today. He's been off the rails. Well, let's show you what, what might have He got it in John Jr.'s supply. Oh, my gosh. Let's show you a star. It's hard to watch, isn't it, Donald? Ron DeSantis betrayed you to become a star, raising millions by stealing your act. Winning straw polls and fans, they're running to Ron, and Ron's running against you. You made him, and he betrayed you. He's laughing at you, running against you. He's taking everything from you, and by the time you fight back, it will be too late. Sad. <laughs> now that's the most recent one that's from this year yep. but we've been playing in this space for over a year because we've, yep. watched, we've seen this coming down the pike we knew that this is where the the as you call them the gentry republicans were going to go and then after desantis had the overwhelming win the only tsunami that happened was in florida and it was ron desantis i don't know who was it the new york post that had ron d victorious what did they have it it was ron, ron the future the future ron the future um, now, you know, Trump is very, even though he lives in Florida now, he still pays attention to New York papers. And the Post is a Rupert Murdoch, part of his Rupert Murdoch empire there, Fox and New York Post, Wall Street Journal, all anointing DeSantis. And so <laughs> we started this a year ago in 2021 with SAD. Hey, Donald. No, we didn't forget about you. Though a lot of people are trying to. People who owe you. People you made. People like Ron DeSantis. Without you, well, he'd be nothing. A loser. But now, now he's the next big thing. He's making it his Republican Party. Everyone says he's better than you. Bigger than you. Smarter than you. Thinner than you. Don't take our word for it. Just watch Fox. He's on all the time. All the time. You? Not so much. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch and Fox picked DeSantis over you for 2024. Sad. Ron is running for president, and with Fox's help, he'll beat you. DeSantis doesn't need you. He even came to New Jersey, just down the road from Bedminster, and didn't pay his respects. And there's nothing you can do about it. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Over a year ago. <laughs> I know the creatures. <laughs> yes, indeed. You saw it here first. So we're going to sit back and watch this. Like I said, the internecine warfare has begun. The knives are out for DeSantis from Trump world and for McCarthy on the Hill. This is going to be an epic battle. I'm telling you right now. And it's going to be complete, utter chaos within the Republican Party. Oh, and let's yeah. hope that Democrats can take advantage of that and get their own shit together because they're going to have leadership races. And, you know, let's let's hope that they got they learned the right lessons from from the midterms and don't go too far to the left and start, you know, putting the squad like you know, in in uh, <laughs> committee here uh, as committee chairman. Let me tell um, you, you know, there's 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 nothing our friends, the Democrats love more than to overinterpret results, good or bad. Yes. Um, Nicole Wallace blocking was and tackling people. Right. That's right. That's what wins games. Uh, Nicole Wallace today had our friend Matt Dowd on, and she was saying how he has a phrase that she uses all the time, which is "Do not overestimate the mandate." <laughs> Do not overestimate overestimate the mandate. And um, my, that's, that's my the... second favorite Matt Dowdism. My first is that <laughs> why do people hate Ted Cruz when they first meet him? Because it saves time. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of him. Ted Cruz is campaigning tonight, I think tonight, with Herschel Walker in Georgia. What this is is really is Ted Cruz really a draw? I mean, I don't get it. You know, I don't get the appeal, this guy. You know, rule 34 <laughs> of the internet says that there's a type of pornography for every taste. <laughs> there may be some sort of cruzy in rule 34 for politics that I just don't I'm not aware of. There must be. You know, I don't get it. Everybody. I'm sure there's a subreddit called Fat Wolverine Fetish or something. But... <laughs> well, he's going to have some competition with J.D. Vance now coming into the Senate. So, in, in, in more than one category. You know, the great thing about J.D. Vance winning, and there's very few great things about him winning, is that there will be somebody in the Senate who's more hateable than Ted Cruz in one-on-one. -on -one. Watch, watch, watch. 
if you don't believe us now, wait until JD Vance Mark becomes my part fucking of the words, Yes, people. exactly. Well, um, we want to make sure, speaking of marking things, we want to make sure that we pay our proper respects to, since we are great patriots and lovers of America and those who serve, yes. today is the 247th birthday of the fantastic Marine Corps, Semper Fi to all of our Marines out there, and we are grateful for their service. Um, as some of you may know, that the Marine Corps was born out of a Philadelphia tavern in 1775 during it the was. Revolutionary War. And, um, you know, it's here we are 247 years later, and we appreciate all of their sacrifices and th what they do Absolutely. so amazingly. And of course, tomorrow is Veterans Day. And um, we want to make sure that we pay our respects to all of our men and women who are in uniform, who serve this country with distinction and honor, and we are grateful for them. And we have several folks who have family members who are in the military or, or who served in the military who may no longer be with us. Um, starting off tonight's tribute, of course, it is my grandfather. My grandfather, Emil Setmayer, there we are several years ago at our hometown parade in Paramus, New Jersey, which he never missed from 1947 until he passed away in 2016. But there's my grandfather. He served in World War II and was part of the VFW in our hometown. Uh, rest in peace, Gramps. But we also have others. Michelle, our creative director and voiceover extraordinaire and some of our best ads. She is a woman of many talents and her family, has served in every American war from the Revolutionary War to the Korean War. That is amazing. And mm -hmm. her sister-in-law right now is currently serving in the Marines and she's a Lieutenant Colonel and she's had tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. So we salute her as well. Um, John Jack Dolly served in the United States Navy from 1943 to 1945 in the Pacific Theater and was recalled to duty for the Korean War, serving again from 1951 to 1952. And then we have others in Michelle's family, David Kinney, the other grandfather. He was inducted into the United States Navy in August of 1943 at the age of 17. He served three years in Pacific Theater and was honorably discharged in 1946. My grandfather also uh, went over it in, in, at 17 years old, too. I think he lied about his age so he could go. <laughs> That's what they did, man. Tough generation, that generation. Oh. The greatest generation, man. And then also we have our chief of staff, Ryan. She wanted to honor her grandfather, Russell Stewart, who served in the Army as a member of the 113th Field Artillery, Artillery Battalion of the 30th Infantry Division from 1942 to 1946. And he helped liberate the Belgians, Belgians from the Germans. So we salute all of them and all of our current veterans and those who are serving. Thank you for your service. And of course, we have a Veterans Day Lincoln Project ad that we want to leave you with tonight. And we hope that everyone ha enjoys their long weekend and recuperates because the fight continues. Before we cut out, yes. one more thing. Yes. Folks, the union is still doing ballot curing operations yes. in Nevada, Arizona, and Colorado, I believe. If you want to help, make sure that every vote is counted. Go to jointheunion.us. They can get you squared away to help with that effort. It's very important. Yes, thank you for reminding me on that because that's super important with those races still going on. Every single effort matters, just like every vote matters. So thank you so much and happy Veterans Day. Thanks folks. Happy Tuesday. Since the dawn of our nation, brave citizens have answered the call to arms when the country was in danger. We hold our veterans in reverence for their courage, their sacrifice and their honor and service to their fellow Americans. Generations of Liberty's sons and daughters have gone into harm's way, manned the battlements, and sailed the seas to preserve freedom for all. Our nation owes a debt of gratitude we can never repay to those who have chosen to answer the call to arms. Today, we honor them and thank them for their service, for their dedication to our nation's preservation and for their oath to the Constitution on which the foundation of our government rests. On this Veterans Day, we ask all Americans to honor the over 18 million veterans among us and thank them for their continued dedication to our country, our freedom, and our future. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising.